Um, can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's fifth meeting in 2016 and ask everyone to switch off electronic devices and mobile phones as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent. <coughs> no apologies have been received. I want to ask under item one if the committee will agree to consider items four and five in private. Item four is a draft stage one report on the Criminal Verdict Scotland Bill and item five is consideration of our work programme. Are you agreed? Item two, this is our main item of business today, and it's an evidence session on agricultural crime. The committee held a roundtable evidence session on this issue back in February 2015, and thereafter the Solicitor General announced a review of agricultural crime prosecution policy. This review concluded in December with the development of a new policy, and the evidence session will therefore focus on the Solicitor General's review and that new policy. And I welcome to meeting Leslie Thompson, QC, Solicitor General for Scotland, and Katrina Dalrymple, Head of Policy Division at the Crown Office, and PF service. And I'll go straight to questions. Margaret, you're on first. Good morning. Uh -huh. uh, can I say at the outset that um, the results that seem to have been achieved, I know, are very much welcomed by the farming community and really are, are, are hugely encouraging. But there was one aspect I did want to, to maybe focus on to begin with, and that was rather than the opportunists then, those that involved serious and, and organised crime and some of the difficulties surrounding prosecuting that. So uh, it would be helpful maybe to elaborate on the nature and some of the problems of these these types of crime what uh, came out probably at the the round table and during the review process was that there was a concern in relation to serious and organized criminality moving into this area of life and in particular a concern around the high value type equipment and vehicles that uh, the farming community will use in their businesses. Now, I'm, I'm quite carefully using the word concern because uh, that's different from reported, reported cases. I think what was important, and we're aware that serious and organised criminality diverse into all sorts of aspects of business life, what was important was that we had the chains of communication in place in order to ensure that if there is any aspect of organised criminality, then the farming community know exactly who to report it to and then how it will be treated thereafter. And that's why included in this policy about agricultural criminality, there's a direct reference to serious and organised crime division and to proceeds of crime. The difficulties in relation to prosecuting this sort of criminality are not a uh, particular in the sense that we're aware that when we're looking at organised criminality, no matter which area in Scotland, we're looking at a business and we have to look at, at it as a group and look at a uh, dealing not with the effect, not just with the offending, but with the money trail and ensuring that we claw that back. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, there seemed to be a suggestion even that they were um, being stolen to order and ending up in Poland, uh, Africa, Afghanistan. I, there must be a trail there that, that, that surely can be followed. And another aspect of it I was wondering about was the issue of sewage sludge, which... Um, sludge yeah. To the money trail and the destination, um, you know, which that's the ceiling to order. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> could, could have that first, how, how hard it, that it, is to... To offend well, the destination and work your way back, as it were. Well, in, in relation to stealing to order, <coughs> there ha is plenty of experience within police and prosecution in relation to stealing to order as far as other areas of a criminality are concerned. So, yes, it's extremely important to ensure that you in gather evidence about the full business <coughs> chain. And I've got business in inverted commas, because what, what you're looking to target are not just those obviously who are turning up and stealing to order, but those at the top of the chain. And then you're looking to ensure that, because uh, it's been done for money, if that is what is being done. And I mean, I think you're quite right to use the term suggestion at, at the moment. We need to be, we very much need to be alert. But what's then important is ensuring that the money trail is followed. And that's why these cases, if there are any 
which the police report to us will be dealt with the same way we deal with other organised criminality in SOCD, ensuring that the specialist prosecutors on the financial side are in at the very start. As well as the money trail, is there advertising, is there online activity that can be monitored because um, obviously there's a market for this? In relation to where the police will ingather their evidence. Oh yes, I mean, I mean absolutely. When it, when it comes to organised criminality, there are a number now of well-used tools of investigation that the police and prosecutors use. And I think it's, it's probably also important to note that if there are cases reported which are, as you are uh, indicating, stealing to order, and are clearly organised criminality, then it will not just be the core offences which would be prosecuted, it would be the offences under the 2010 Act of directing organised crime, being involved in organised crime, or the aggravation of organised crime. And the intimidation aspect, you know, farmers by their very nature and agricultural crime tends to be um, rural, tends to be a little bit isolated, <coughs> and there, there was evidence that farmers felt very much intimidated, um, and they were threatened sometimes when they, they said they would be reporting things, you know, that, you know, your barn will be burnt down, or, um, or these kind of threats. Is that being addressed as well? I think uh, that in information that, that came out, and also came out, came out during the review, and it's a I agree with you in, in relation to a, if you feel you're in a, an isolated part and there's, there's nobody who is who's going to pay attention if something happens. What was extremely important about bringing everybody together in the review was to ensure that there was confidence as far as any victims of crime are concerned that if anything like that occurs, it will be taken seriously by law enforcement authorities and a treated appropriately. Mm -hmm. And I think that confidence building w was, w was very important. I would imagine the intelligence gathering, just getting together as uh, with all these different uh, people reporting on the different aspects would be a, a huge advantage. But oh, oh, yeah. I know you want to, I've, I've given you, I'll let you back in. I, I want to keep you that. off that just now. You can okay. book that place. <laughs> Margaret's <laughs> going to ask about sewerage right. sludge. Nobody dare <laughs> touch that. Shot. Nobody touch the sewerage, <laughs> right? Christian, did you want a supplementary to the destination? If not, I've got a little list of people. Organised crime, yes. Uh, no, I'll move on because I've got Gil, and then I've, you're next anyway. Right. Gil, then it's Christian, then Elaine, then Margaret McDougall. Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks very much, can be a Solicitor General. Uh, we heard the evidence that some of this very high-tech equipment, very, very expensive equipment that's lying around, and I would say that advisedly, that it's not protected. It's um, maybe not got a, a disabler in it. It's you know there's no no way of it be, being protected. I just wondered if there's any work being done in that regard to encourage uh, the owners of the equipment if it's not already in place. Uh, the idea that it would be lying in a field or even in a farmyard unprotected is kind of a notion that uh, it certainly wouldn't happen in in a, in a, in a city. I think uh, one of the things which is important about uh, well, all sorts of, of, of criminality is ensuring that there's prevention in, in place, and obviously that's a lead as far as police are concerned. Now, as a result of the review and the joint, the joint working in this area, SPARK, which is the Scottish Partnership Against the Rural Crime, is now up and in operation and I think submitted to the committee separately a list of all the preventative type measures to ensure that those in the farming community are aware of what's out there to have your, your property marked or recorded uh, information about uh, your equipment and there's a, there's a, there's is a it the long, Caesar? Long is it, it, sorry, yeah. Solicitor General. I think it's the Caesar crime, uh, Caesar scheme, um, in the briefing that we have. Is that what you're referring to? Well, there, there's forensic marking. There's the Caesar scheme. There's also <coughs> a being general 
training and awareness training in relation between the police and the farming community. The police have clear, and who, who a chair and, and lead smart, but also have clear leads now within the, the community so that they have that, that direct link and prevention is very much part of that. Yeah. I was certainly ha a, a heartened a, with your, your briefing and it, it explains that, and it, which is, is good. So it seems that things are certainly moving on in regards to preventative uh, 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 action being taken. But I wondered if there was any work being done with regards to, again, farm yards itself. It's a question I raised, and the explanation I was given uh, from the questioner, uh, from the, the, the person asked the question, uh, was that it was very expensive to install closed circuit t television. Uh, and, you know, Actually, I think it, it's nowadays it's it's quite the, the the costs are quite small because now you can get wireless uh, systems. And I wondered if there was any uh, progress in regards to to protecting the farm yard itself. In in relation to all methods of prevention, that has been discussed during the with Spark and during the review process. I, between the police and the farming community. I don't have information on costs of CCTV, but I'm not sure whether there was, it, because Mr Rimple was involved in the various review meetings, whether anything specific came up or not. If not, we can take it away and get back to you yeah, on it. I don't good. think there was anything specific um, in terms of the prohibitive cost, but there was a recognition that um, it was an additional cost for farmers in terms of the preventative methods that they would want to introduce and that they were encouraged to introduce by the insurers, for example, um, which is obviously a key um, in terms of their insurance premiums and all the rest of it. Um, so yes, it was something that was raised and it was certainly um, the, the focus very much of um, Spark has been on what can the communities do together to make sure that um, thieves are prevented from targeting agricultural communities. You second guess my next question, which is an insurance the, the benefit they get. So thanks very much. That, that's fine, Camina. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Christian, please. Thank you, Mr. Uh, good morning. morning. Uh, we had uh, we had when we took evidence uh, from uh, Dr. Robert Smith of the University of the West of Scotland. It suggested that organisations such as the Mafia were involved in such affairs. That you know. We, it seems to me that there is a recurrence of, of these thefts more and more, but there is a, a very different type of thefts. It's organized crime like the Mafia, or maybe you are aware of a sister uh, organization, the Camorra in Napoli. These two organizations are, are very well versed on, on, uh, on, uh, on profiteering from farming communities. So to what extent uh, uh, do you think we are in such a case in Scotland, or is it only an observation? There is no proof that organised crime like the Mafia or the Camorra have now infiltrated our countryside. As was indicated earlier, there were concerns expressed. Concerns expressed about organised criminality are different from cases reported and definitive intelligence. And at this stage, I can't say there's anything more than concerns expressed. And what I thought it was very important to do was to ensure that we sent the message out there that as far as agricultural crime is concerned, if there is any suggestion of organised criminality, thinking that this is going to be easy money. Well, when it comes to organised criminality, Scotland are actually very ready for them and have asset recovery rules which are far ahead of some other countries uh, out there. So I cannot uh, provide you with any confirmation in relation to reported cases. The, the, the danger is this organisation are very good to infiltrate a sector and then trying to, uh, to be part of that sector. So that would be a worry. Uh, for, for this committee, if, 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 if what we uncover is going to lead to this, so it'd be good that you come back maybe uh, in a year's time or, or to, to, we, we, uh, no, <laughs> to, to this committee who <laughs> will be a <laughs> member. But it would it, be good that that's followed up and not forgotten about because the, the, the organised crime can have a very detrimental effect 
to, to sector, and we've seen it in Italy. Uh, for example, uh, the, the member talk about strategy, but there is problem of cheese making and, 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 and other problems which could very much be being affected. C can I, I just... just too much, unless you want to say something I, I, about I, European I, liaison, which would be interesting at how you liaise if, if it's across continents, what kind of liaison takes place across Europe with other um, parties dealing with serious organised crime, either the police in other countries or the prosecution? How they does are, that work? Uh, <coughs> There's a variety of different ways that liaison is done in relation to organised oh, criminality. Tell us about yes, uh, yes. But I'm, I think probably better if I... I'm certainly happy to write to you and update you what I, what I can tell you, but I've, I've certainly s sat round the table on more than one occasion with European partners in relation to organised criminality. What, what, what I was going to say to provide assurance is that law enforcement, police and prosecutors are very much aware that organised criminality seeks to diversify mm -hmm. and uh, move into new areas of business. And if this is an area of business that they're thinking of moving into, well, the message is... Uh, is out there that he don't because we, we are we're aware and the tools are ready. And making sure as well that the victims are aware that it could yes. be that can because it's so important. You don't respond the same way to, to common theft but you but you respond to, 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 to organized crime. You need a lot more protection. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. They always put things in our legacy paper. Um, uh, for the next Justice Committee to continue with. I have a long list, so I've got Elaine, followed by Margaret Dougal, followed by John, followed by Roderick. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Convener. Um, we received evidence about the distress caused to farmers by loss of livestock, whether that be by sheep worrying and so on, which tends to you know, increase at this sort of time of year as you go into the spring, or, or through theft of valuable livestock. In terms of um, where animals are killed by dogs or whatever, what sort of recourse do, do the farm, does the farmer get in court in terms of what can be done? You know, obviously if somebody says their dog, they didn't know their dog was out and worrying sheep, uh, yeah, how about, you know, in terms of the financial compensation and the compensation for the distress caused to the farmer and so on by, by what's happened to the stock, what, what, what sort of recourses available to them in the courts? One, one of the biggest things which uh, came out of the review was to ensure a proper understanding of the impact of agricultural criminality on the, on the farming community. And you'll see within the policy that there are a list of the various mm -hmm. types of a impact or mm -hmm. distress, a financial a cost that can have occurred. And it's very, very important that those who are working in this area, very important to the farming mm -hmm. community, and. and uh, and to us to understand that, that criminality and for them to have the assurance mm -hmm. that when cases like this are reported, all the variety of impacts will be taken on board by the police, passed to the prosecutor. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point of, uh, uh, that, that you asked me about. We need to do that going forward to ensure that all that information is before the court so that the court can uh, then take that into account in deciding what a sentence is appropriate, because that sentence can include a compensation. And on smaller, lower level type uh, criminality, one of the other things which came out during the review from the farming uh, and agricultural community was it, it's very important to them if there have been financial costs mm. lost and sometimes more important to have that recovered than to have to go through a long court process mm. and be away from away from farms etc so and that's something that uh, we have to take on board when we're looking at cases that are at the, the lower mm. level of, of so financial impact. For example, if a farmer loses a substantial number of, of sheep and lambs because they've been worried by dogs, what sort of sentences are available and what sort of compensation would be available in terms of what? Whether, whether the 
I, I, I can't indicate to you what sort of sentence or compensation will be available because that will be a matter for mm. the presiding judge in the day. What I can give you an assurance of is that all that information will be available firstly in the police report and then put before the court so that the judge can, can decide what's appropriate. Now, what, what, one, what one would expect is that a person is compensated for the losses that have occurred, but all that will also be dependent on finances which are, are, are available to the perpetrator to pay mm. back and that at the end of the day is a, yeah. a I mean, I think my, matter for my concern really was you know in terms of these types of crimes under the legislation which is available at the moment does the punishment fit the crime basically I think we're asking not you to intervene in the judicial decision but what is the range of sentence mm. available for the crimes described yeah. by my colleague Oh, and, you know, should we be doing more? Yeah. Should we be taking this more seriously? Yeah. And, and um, if they're statutory, should we increase them? And to what? We'll wait. It's all right. We'll go on to something else yeah. while you're No, 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 it's okay. Sure? I just wanted to be absolutely sure that we didn't get reported back during the review that the law was not fit for purpose. Mm. What was reported back during the review was a concern that the impact of these crimes mm. was not being fully understood at initial stages, not mm. being fully uh, understood at the court stage, and that was because the right information had not been ungathered and was put before the yeah. court. And that's <coughs> the bit we've taken care of, rather than the law and not, yeah. not providing. But, I mean, because there is now a group in place, you might look at that. that may get no, fed back in the future. Yes, yes. thanks. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, Margaret McDougall, followed by John, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Good morning. Uh, can I just follow on from uh, my colleague's question? You know, you're, you're talking about compensation there. Are farmers able to claim insurance for, you know, the loss of livestock? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, part of the... Uh, well, depend on... Their own, insurance, in, their own insurance yeah. policy. Mm -hmm. But part of the uh, joint working uh, now in, uh, includes the NFU mutual. Yes, yes yeah. that's right. Okay, then. Um, I wasn't on the, the committee when uh, they took evidence last year, but I note that there was some mention made of Farm Watch and Rural Watch, uh, these organisations that have been set up to alert farmers when criminals might be operating in the area. How well used is these organisations? I think, I think that... Uh, uh, well, I would have thought that information was, you know, there within the forum, so... The, all I was going to say was that there's information about that in, relation, uh, in, in the police briefing. And the reason mm -hmm. I'm hesitating is because while these uh, watches are in place, I think what's important is ensuring that they're fully used. Mm -hmm. And within the submission in, in relation to this, and this is all on the preven prevention side, it seems to me this is still an ongoing area of work. Right, so the information Sorry. isn't filtering down yeah. to all farmers. Is my my understanding is that the watch schemes, um, they're, they're presently being reviewed by Police Scotland Safer Communities Division, um, and that's the number of different watch schemes that have been introduced mm -hmm. across the rural communities. So I understand that there's a kind of evaluation undergoing at the moment in terms of the impact of them. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it's fair to say that we're, we're not sure about the success of these types of schemes as yet, um, apart from anecdotally. And we did hear throughout the, the review that um, some farmers were reporting that the Rural Watch, the kind of phone call from farm to farm to farm to see the scene of suspicious car um, worked well in some areas. Um, but that was very much anecdotal evidence that we heard um, mm -hmm. coming through the review. Um, but my understanding is there's not as yet been a full evaluation of these schemes. Okay, then. Uh, I mean, I also note from last year that some farmers were unsure which number to call, whether it would be 101 or 999, if there was something happening within the area. Has that been overcome now? I can't comment specifically in, re in relation to the police operation of, of, of their watch schemes beyond it's within the group there were 
concerns that have been taken forward and as I think we're indicating this is still an area of, of ongoing work. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair Which to say that that issue was raised at one of the um, SPARC meetings that I was at and, and the police yeah. had um, very much taken the feedback on in terms of the number and the location and I think there were um, measures put in place by Police Scotland to yeah. address that as so I'd, I'd say to the members, I know we're itching to ask some questions I mean, and quite right, maybe the police would be better so we can always in our work programme to discuss whether we have the police in for a short question and answer session with regard to their role in mm -hmm. agricultural crime markets. Yeah, I just wondered how the, the information gets out to uh, you know, the countryside and farmers and people who live in remote areas. And Is there an educational issue there? Which you the, the, there's an educational issue in relation to this whole area. Yes, mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right about that. The rural watch programmes are, are, are one part of it. And what a uh, has been important in relation to the joint working that's going on this year as a result of the, the concerns that were raised in, in the roundtable at this committee is that there's awareness training needed in the farming community as far as Police Scotland are concerned, amongst prosecutors. And I suppose what I'm saying is that area is now in place but ongoing. You, you may you. know in the sorry, sorry you may, know, you may know in the, the update um, that the Police Scotland briefing that they provided, um, they refer to a large number of engagement events that they're undertaking throughout mm -hmm. the year with young farmers groups, local yes, riding schools, yes, yeah, rural yeah. shows. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's obviously a, the, the Royal Highland Show, which attracts mm -hmm. a, a huge number of, of individuals from the agricultural community. There's a lot of work um, and kind of um, information available to individuals there in terms of prevention and, and, and detection there. So it's very much about tapping into to every area that, that, that they possibly can to encourage reporting and encourage that confidence. And of course, I, some of us have large rural constituencies and that's where a lot of farmers do exchange a great deal of information as well as socialise. So um, and there are many of them, of course, many of these events. Um, I go to John followed by Roderick, please. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, morning, Solicitor morning. General. Solicitor General, it's an excellent document and, and obviously lays out very high standards. It's particularly um, interested in the information that's to be provided to, uh, in your paragraph 23, provided to you by Police Scotland, covering issues like distress, the cost, cost of replacement, hiring replacement, the immediate impact on the business, business interruption, and in relation to vandalism, also photographs. I'm wondering, as I say, these are very high standards. If I was a self-employed painter, decorator in an urban area, can I expect the same level of attention from Police Scotland and the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service as that? You can certainly uh, expect consistent attention from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. What uh, this review identified was that there needed to be a greater understanding in agricultural crime areas. Now, if you're talking about business laws, painter and decorator, and there's criminal activity in relation to your business laws, yes, I would expect to be, to be told about that. I think what uh, became clear and why there was a concern amongst agricultural communities was that many of us who are very well used to city-type crime and business crime did not fully understand the impact that there was in agricultural communities, and that's why I've had it spelled out, absolutely spelled out. OK, well, that's good. So, so that was happening anyway. So in relation to any vandalism to self-employed painter, decorator, well, plumber? Come on, John. Impact, come on, John. Of, impact of criminality, mm. impact of criminality no, just a minute, resulting in General. Loss. Just yeah. a minute, just a minute. I, I mean, we're asking about the review on agricultural crime. So I'd like us to focus on that but, but and focus on that. I hear you, John, but that's what I'd like you. us to well, focus yes, on. Yes, so General, we can do something on painters and decorators another day. Now, I'm going so to move General, on if you keep that. I was trying to that. understand this. Is this rolling out existing practice or is this new practice um, which will be rolled out, out with rural communities? In relation to understanding the impact of crime, if that involves financial loss, prosecutors know that. This list contains particular elements that the farming community felt were not being taken into account. No, well, that, that's good. Um, thanks. Also, in relation to information received from Police Scotland, they talk about um, 
your, your staff dealing with these um, being provided with training on the emotional impact. Um, I wonder, we seem to have a crossover here because it starts off as a partnership against rural crime and there seems to be an interchange between the words rural and agricultural. In the broadest sense, it, the, the, this, most of what we seem to be dealing with today seems to suggest that rural communities are the victims. I, I wonder about the occasion, uh, there's no pick-up in relation to occasions where, for instance, the accused might be from rural communities. Yes. So, so, for instance, when, when that training is to pick up on the issues of, excuse me, the issues of the emotional impact on rural communities and individuals. For instance, the, the recent shooting of beavers in Tayside, that might uh, suggest a crime, the use of underpowered weapons. It might sh suggest overt cruelty, the poisoning of raptors. Is, is that something that you have envisaged should be picked up in this overall policy of attention to rural crime? There's a specialist, a prosecutors, a specialist team in relation to wildlife and environmental it's crime, that, that, that's already in place and has been in place for some time. It, it, I, I have to apologise. I'm not quite understanding uh, your, your question on, on this one. Okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll have another go. Um, the, we're told by Police Scotland that your staff ha have been provided training in the, the financial, and we've covered that bit, and emotional impact that agricultural offences can have in rural businesses. Most of the issues that I have raised with me are about uh, abuse of wildlife. And it's the... Oh, no. I mean, I, uh, yeah, that is a separate issue. I'm sorry well, to you correct you. Question, You're on to abuse of wildlife. We're talking about agricultural crime. We're talking about rustling. We're talking theft of vehicles. We're talking about vandalism on farms, intimidation. That's what this remit of this is. And is that your question? No, I'll pass them. Thanks Thank you much very much. Though I would pick up on something that John said, which I think was relevant, which is the issue of crime committed by, it's not just outsiders. Uh, given that um, I had a case where a farmer lost 300 sheep rustled over a short period, a couple of years. I was quite shocked at that. Didn't bother reporting it. Didn't know it happened until they brought the sheep down off the hill. But he told me that it's definitely a shepherd that's doing it. He was taking them along, the, the sheep were being taken along the old drove road, drovers' uh, roads and so on, and taken. It was, and so what's the intelligence system like within the farming community um, of awareness that there may be, it might be another you know, shepherd or some the former shepherd who's at this? And it isn't big time mafia or something, but you know, is someone within the rural community who knows what they're doing? Because she can't, I couldn't drive 300 sheep <laughs> to safely somewhere. But he was clear it was somebody who was a, a shepherd or a former shepherd that was doing it. Now, I'm interested in the intelligence from within the community about, you know, the, and the, how secure it is to whistleblow. Well, that's part of uh, one of the questions I was asked earlier about mm. uh, in, in, in intimidation of farmers and what was reported back because equally that applies whether you're talking about organized criminality or whether yes. you're talking about people in the area round about that's not something which is a uh, sadly particular to a uh, agricultural communities that that happens in cities as well yes. and in relation to that what's necessary is to have in place a system where those who are victims suffered loss, etc., feel confident that if they provide information to the police, and the police would be the first point of contact here, about a persons who are within the community, not coming from the outside in, then that is going to be treated appropriately and they are going to feel safe and it's going to be dealt with properly by the authorities. And I think the joint working and the awareness training at police level is building building that confidence. Was and we that? will, within yeah. the joint working groups, it will be, it, because there's now a channel of, of, of communication from the National Farmers Union who, who will provide the sort of information that, that you're uh, providing if that happens going forward. And it can then be uh, discussed, why is this a problem? What else needs to be done to make sure people are confident in providing that sort of intelligence? I'm interested to know, um, was that raised at the group? How significant <coughs> was that at the group in discussing farmers feeling confident to perhaps, and it's a very close community, although they live far apart, yeah, yeah. 
confident enough to say something, um, uh, you know, and know that they can feel secure. We say maybe wrong. The, the, there was some some anecdotes. It wasn't raised as as a, as a big issue, but it was raised in terms of kind of anecdotes, and, and there did appear to be a slight reluctance to. Um, come forward with information when they believed it was somebody living within their own community um, and I think that that's very fair to say so that that mm -hmm. is about confidence um, and it's, there, there was there was elements of loyalty there um, if it had been somebody that worked for them for example Indeed. Um, that had taken advantage <coughs> excuse me so um, it, it, for us it was all about making sure that we had um, a clear policy that we would follow in terms of the impact and that they understood that they knew what we would do and how we would respond to that so that we would provide them with the confidence um, behind that if they chose to report that. I'll leave that just now. Roderick. Thank you. <coughs> um, morning, Sister General. Morning. I just wanted to develop that theme slightly in terms of uh, the extent to which there may be a kind of non-reported crime, whether a result of intimidation or because it involves people in kind of an intimate local community. In the course of prosecutions that take place, have, have, have you managed to form a view as to whether or not um, it's a tip of the iceberg, or are you confident that most kind of uh, significant crime is getting to the stage, getting to your attention? I, it, it is quite difficult to talk, to talk about a negative. We, we have a as a result of working together, received certain information that, that Mr Rimple still indicated, or ha rather has just indicated about anecdotal concerns about not coming forward. What I can say about the information received during the process was it was not huge numbers of any sort of, of criminality within the agricultural or, or, or rural community, that was not a concern that there were huge numbers of a cases that were not coming to us, that were not being dealt with properly. There were small numbers and on occasions the same case information being a incident being repeated. And what, what's what I take as important about that when it was the same case information that was coming forward from different groups is the impact that even one case can have on a community if, if it's not dealt with in the correct way. But no, not a, from what we have received so far, not large numbers. Okay, thank you. And in terms of um, training, there's reference in the police paper to um, some kind of training of uh, Crown Office prosecutors uh, in next month in March 2016. Could you give us a bit more information on uh, how the Crown Office goes about training prosecutors in the area and what particularly to look for in uh, this is just the general approach the well we have a training we have a, a, a training and, and learning division which develops our training in relation to the particular training for this sort of criminality the first thing that that happens is that the lead prosecutor was appointed during the review so there's always that single single point of contact there's then the policy, there's internal guidance in relation to how you deal with individual cases and that's all written type of, of guidance. The training as far as agricultural uh, crime and the new policy is concerned will be in, in, in two parts. Firstly, there's e-learning training for every prosecutor. Every prosecutor will have to undergo that. The training a programme is just about, our package is just about complete and will be rolled out for every prosecutor to have to undertake from, from the 1st of March. Those who will be making the decision making in relation to uh, these cases when they appear will also undergo specialist training which has and is a the more traditional type of training that you would expect. I'm not sure whether it's over one day or, or more than I think it's one day. One day. A training which has been developed along with the National Farmers Union and Police Scotland, and they will they are participants a, leading that training along with COPFS. Is and that's to ensure that those who are making the decision-making at that stage fully understand the policy, fully understand what I consider is important the most important thing in this, the impact and the right information about the crime so you can determine 
a, the seriousness and whether or not it is opportunistic or there's a, a more sinister undertone. So those prosecutors involved in that will do the second, a more detailed training. And that too will be in, will commence in March. Any, any other themes apart from kind of serious and opportunistic, that distinction that you're particularly trying to get with the prosecutors to understand, or is it part of just the general background to agricultural life, is it? General background to agricultural life, the impact of, of the criminality, the types of offences which are, are most likely to occur, and uh, the information received from the farming community as, or the agricultural community rather, as to their expectations as to how this will be dealt with within the justice system and that absolute necessity that all information is before the court. So some of these offences are, are specialists like livestock worrying, but others such as theft, then you know the sufficiency of evidence yeah. to prove a theft, etc., is the same. But what's surrounding it and the impact may be very different. Okay, thank you. Margaret. Through each slide. <laughs> um, it, it's an issue that's been brought up in the Parliament more or less since the Parliament's inception, and we still haven't got to grips with it. Um, it involves serious organised crime, it involves the, the dumping of sometimes untreated sewage, and there's big money in, in this coming from other countries, being imported in here, and then being spread in agricultural land. It involves companies transporting the, the sludge, ceasing to... Um, trade and then starting up again as a new business and continuing as soon as they come under the, the microscope. It seems to me something that should come under agricultural and rural crime and yet the difficulty is I think no one person takes the lead. Is it Police yeah. Scotland? Is it Environmental Health? Is it the local authority? Is it SEPA? Um, and I think we're awaiting a report from the Agricultural Minister but it is something where there's big money, organised crime, intimidation, all the things we've been looking at in, in this um, study. I think I, I would regard that area as crossing from agricultural into environmental, but if I was to put it in a box, I would put it in the environmental. And the links between environmental and organised criminality across the, across the world are a known and there has been work within our specialists. We have specialists who deal with environmental criminality and I, I don't want you to think that these are all individual boxes because there are mm -hmm. exactly as you're describing that, that sort of crossover but I think what is important yeah. is that prosecutors are specially trained in each of, of, of these areas I so made a little in no, to, that, that's helpful yeah, although I'm itself. so impressed with Margaret's knowledge of sewerage <laughs> sludge well, I didn't it's been know. around since 1999 she hasn't, she hasn't got that on her CV <clears throat> and there was a very good meeting in Parliament years ago between SEPA and the police dealing with yeah. environmental crime um, I don't it's see oh, I, didn't, I don't see any other questions <laughs> um, one thing I'm going to get for take you is the membership of this group um, that you have, um, the agricultural crime uh, group. The, the, is there any role for, and this may sound very frivolous, and I don't mean it to be, ramblers or hillwalkers uh, association, you know, who are warned, they, they're out in the hills where farmers can't patrol, they don't have CCTV. Is there any role for them in being alerted so that they too, when they're out, if they see something odd, you know, in an area they're walking, they feel to they, they may report it whether they should be on that group because, you know, they're they're out where nobody else is and in weather when perhaps nobody else is out. That's my question. Yeah, yeah as, far, as far as I'm concerned, anyone who is able to uh, provide the sort of information or assistance as far as this. Uh, problem of criminality is concerned uh, would, would, would be helpful. What we'll do is we'll take that forward. We'll find the yeah. right group to contact and see whether they are interested yes. in, in yes, being Yes, there'll be different groups in different yeah. geographical areas perhaps. But it, that, that was raised by the farmer with me when he's not out. Yeah. And, I mean, he took me miles <coughs> in his, uh, his four wheels. I thought he was trying to create a by-election. He took me to some wild places. But um, that was the point he raised with me. Yeah. He says sometimes people tell him when they're walking past the farm gate, having been out in a walk, that they've seen something while they were out, and just bringing, whether it's dogs running loose or something 
more organised than that that they've been able to mention it, and I didn't see them on the list. And you no, know, they, they're, they they're handy. haven't been involved in the review to date. Um, but again, as a solicitor general, thank I'd you. Be more than happy to consider that. Christian, it's not yeah, sewerage, it's no, no, not environmental. It, no, it's, it's on the court. It's just to try to help as much as possible farmers to go and report and making sure that if they have to go to court, uh, sometimes it's very difficult, especially the one looking after animals. Have we considered uh, an extensive use of video link just to make sure that farmers don't need to leave you know, the animals? Well, you're now straying into a completely yes. different yes. area yeah. of a, ensuring that the justice system is modern, yeah. digitalised. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't want to go there, John. <laughs> Sludge, I don't want to go to the video links. Can I thank you? Thank you very much for your evidence. And it, I think it may be useful to the committee to have Police Scotland and perhaps the NFU with a different focus. Some of the questions I feel would be useful to Police Scotland. Thank you very much thank indeed. I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to allow witnesses to change over.
very much. I put my microphone back up again, having been indiscreet. Um, item 3, EU priorities. Um, it's the latest update from the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs in relation to EU issues, previously identified as areas of particular interest. Our papers also include an update from the Minister on the most recent EU Justice and Home Affairs Council meeting held 3rd and 4th December. Roderick. As our e no, I've got more. I'm going to build your part. Okay. As our EU reporter, would you like to highlight any particular issues in the paper and suggest any course of action? Uh, we now I, speak. I think that the paper and uh, the comprehensive letter from the minister uh, says it all. Just a couple of things. Obviously, in relation to human <coughs> rights, there is work going on in this parliament in the European and External Relations Committee. Um, that committee received a private visit from... Um, the Joint Committee on Human Rights of the Westminster Parliament um, a few weeks ago, without betraying too much in the way of confidences, I think detected there was a little bit of frustration in, in Westminster at the kind of the delay in progress of the UK government's proposals in relation to a British Bill of Rights. Uh, the extent to which this Parliament, through the European External Relations Committee, will be carrying out work in relation to human rights is obviously fast diminishing in the absence of those proposals given the, the time scale for before this parliament uh, um, reaches its conclusion in March. Um, so that's an issue. Obviously the minister's uh, letter talks about, particularly about EU migration crisis and it's hard to uh, think that the whole question of migration issues in the European Union are not going to come back on the European agenda in a very big way in the months ahead. And, uh, and even looking back at what was agreed in May last year, I think things have considerably moved on. In terms of the more technical issues, then obviously uh, we're waiting for a revised version of Brussels 2A, dealing with kind of which uh, courts, which which, juris which courts of jurisdiction in matrimonial matters are matters of parental re responsibility. But that's very much a work in progress. And the other issue, obviously, that the minister highlights is. Uh, directives in relation to the Paris attacks and foiled terrorism. But again, um, highly topical, and I imagine that those kind of issues of combating terrorism and, uh, and control of acquisition of weapons will remain high on the EU agenda. Um, the rest of it is really self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Do you wish to comment? John. Thank you. I, I think it's an excellent uh, paper. I'm grateful for the Minister and uh, for, for all this information. I thought particularly in relation to the detailed um, information about the progress to date on the objectives in relation to um, the um, EU agenda on migration was particularly uh, helpful on the, the link of where Scotland comes in in relation to this, despite the UK being the, 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 the nation state. So I, I found that very interesting. And I think the migration issue has um, been one of the biggest tests of the European Union to date and, and has failed. Um, we have, because it's not top of the media, but we're still seeing hundreds of people um, trying to make that journey in flimsy craft and hundreds of people drowning. And I think we should never forget that just because it's not on the front line of the television anymore. It's still happening and it's extremely disappointing. And of course, there's also the issue with the referendum, which probably whatever, whenever that happens, if it, it, it does, if it's in June or deferred to September, it does seem to, it's going to happen this year, that this all then becomes just thrown in the air to some extent until the result of that referendum, uh, Roddy, would you like to comment? Because we've also got the issue of human rights, we've got the issue of, without going into a yes and no debate yeah. here, disentangling so much of EU legislation, yeah. well, the, the which the, forms part the, of our yeah, legislation. The European External Affairs Committee have been doing some work on um, the EU referendum, considering what the implications are for Scotland and that work is ongoing. In fact, I think it's another session on Thursday, which is covering uh, some of that. And could um, you could you expand a little on how it would affect justice, the justice yeah. issues in the? Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, specifically the result. Well, who knows what the result of the referendum would be? But I mean, obviously, uh, potentially, if you move back to Fortress Britannia, it would uh, mm -hmm. open up a whole uh, debate about the, the extent of cooperation, um, not only between the UK as a whole and the uh, uh, European, uh, the European Union, but also um, the separate nature of ju justice systems north and south of the border. So people will probably be looking at that relationship mm -hmm. in the context yeah. of a, a no vote, um, seeing how that would progress in the future. So, Would uh, it actually mean amending some of our legislation, our statutes, where we have 
imported duties or imported um, certain well, there's rules. A, obviously, because there's an issue with the extent to which kind of uh, European law is uh, directly part of Scots law, and the extent to which, mm -hmm. um, with a no vote, for example, that might be impacted. Yeah. Any other and you'd comments? have to consider whether Margaret. or not it would remain. Sorry, oh, Mar then Margaret. Margaret McDougall and Margaret Mitchell. <coughs> yeah, I was interested in the paragraph. Oh, sorry, Margaret Mitchell, then Margaret McDougall. Sorry. I got it the wrong way round. You'll be all right. She's not going to talk about sewerage. <laughs> Margaret. Uh, about the negotiations about creating a European Public Prosecutor's Office, how that didn't comply with the principle of subsidiarity, uh -huh, and that we were just monitoring that to make sure there wasn't an adverse um, implications for the Scottish pr prosecutorial system. Any update on that? No, but I think, it, I, I take your point, it would probably be an answer if we're going to write to the Minister about anything, mm. asking for an update on what the mm. current position is in terms of uh, the EPPO. Yeah. Okay. Margaret McDougall. Okay. So it was just around the video conferencing and yeah. You know, if you could perhaps give an which, update. Which, where are you referring to? What page is that, Margaret? Page four. <coughs> the letter from the Minister for Community Safety and Legal <coughs> Affairs. And uh, it does say that although Scotland cannot access funds for the Justice Programme as the UK has opted out, we are currently laying the ground for potential applications to Connecting Europe facility later in 2016. Uh, to support a number of EU e-justice portal interconnection yeah. projects. Is there any update on that? Well, this is obviously a letter from the Minister dated the 21st of January. It would, again, oh, probably right, be, yeah. Yeah, be useful saying he says he will update any developments just to perhaps formally, if you write to him, asking him to ensure if there are any updates, particularly before March the 23rd, that the committee are advised. <coughs> Christian. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks very much for that. It, 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 it's very informative, and uh, you know, thanks for the uh, European and External Relations uh, Committee as well for the good work that they have done, which part we could have done, but unfortunately we don't have time to, to do everything. I, I just want the fear that there are so many topics involved uh, which are hanging on. Uh, to, from the 23rd of March to the 6th of May, uh, what's happening if there are directives coming in? If uh, anything happening? Can we have some reassurance there that nothing will be moved forward when we know Parliament sitting? Well, Parliament is sitting? well then we're into the problems of PERDA. Um, obviously, we cease to be MSPs, but there still, cease, there still is a government, but there are certain constraints as to what governments can and can't do in a period of PERDA. Um, I'm not sure I can take it much further. I think, I think yeah. broadly speaking, it can be administration, yeah. but there can't be any policy announcements or anything of that kind during the PERDA. It's a worry. Well, it's life. You're going to stop being an MSP in March the 23rd, no, well, like it or lump it. Well, there are a lot of things involved there which, which could, uh, could have happened at, at, at any time. And I wouldn't but like the UK government's not in front, I remember, so I yeah. we, are, we have which that is, issue. Which is what? Margaret. Question, perhaps Roddy can. Oh, we're not in PERDA, we're dissolved. And you're like dissolved, me, my dear, you're the dissolved. Um, yes. Is there around the. On the same stats on the same page, is around a 16, 17 year old um, yeah. directives on the presumption of innocence. Where are we with that then? Well, I think the, gov the government's view is general, um, uh, <coughs> reasonably content that, yeah. that, that, that our domestic law complies with uh, any issues and directives in terms of presumption of innocence. As far as the uh, 16, 17 year olds are concerned, we had a reasonable debate about this before we passed the Criminal Justice Scotland Act and views mm -hmm. as to to that uh, review. So uh, are there any specific points that a member wants to address to uh, the minister? Perhaps, perhaps so I'll put them forward or perhaps there's also the, the, letter. the general problem we have in, in our legislation that such varying ages uh, for different yeah. kinds of duties and rights and protections, mm -hmm. um, some of them inherited about the age of marriage, you know, and so on, which is, you know, we might not have now. Uh, so I think that's maybe a bigger issue uh, yeah. for the Parliament and at large. Can yeah, I there, there's also sorry, the point Roddy. I just want to stress, if you look at the bottom of that paragraph, that yeah. section, it said the UK government did not opt into any of the above measures. So to a degree, it's kind of, it's, uh, it's, it's a matter for yep. this Parliament. Now, okay. um, then, thank you. so can I just uh, thank you very much, Roddy, for that. It's a huge range of things, and as I say, it's a bit up in the air just now. Um, can we 
take a view of what we would like to do. Any issues we want to raise the Minister? Any significant urgent issues arise otherwise to conclude consideration of EU issues for this parliamentary session? Agree to write the Minister to give evidence to expand on the issues set out in his update or write to the European and External Relations Committee seeking an update on his work in relation to human rights and EU migration. <coughs> John. I wonder, convener. It's a good job I understand body language. Alison is going like this. I think it's none of the above. <laughs> yes. John. Yeah. Um, thanks, convener. Um, previously, we were very exercised about the, the Lisbon opt out. Now, I, I think a lot of issues have been um, um, covered and grateful, as I say, to Rory for that report. I wonder if it would be just asking the Minister where things sit in relation to that previous position, just the overall. Okay. Anybody yeah. else? Um, Jock Roddy? Yeah, I think we should specifically ask raise Alice's point on the EPPO for what that's worth. Um, uh, I don't think that we want to give the Minister too hard a time on this issue, these issues generally, between now and March the 23rd. Is it worth Roddy writing to the European External Relations Committee and updating its work in relation to human rights and EU migration, or, or should we just read the reports? Um, I would suggest read the reports. Okay. So that's us concluded that item. Thank you very much. Now we're moving into private session. Public gallery clear, please. And I'll give you a little break while we get the screen set up.